Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this Thursday morning for our virtual student in the workplace connection. My name is Ann Conti. I work with the North um, IU5 Northwest Tri-County Intermediate Unit, and we are able to offer you these sessions in conjunction with Northwest PA Job Connect, so very thankful to them, and we're happy you are joining us. Welcome back if you've been with us a couple of times, and welcome if this is your first time joining us this morning we have bethany from she is from nasa and i'm gonna let her explain her title and her um where she works because full disclosure i forgot to pull that up before we started and i don't want to get it wrong so we were busy chatting and i i don't have that up right now but she'll be able to share that with you she's got some content to share with you some very cool things that she's been involved with and then for the last sort of half of our session, she'll be able to answer questions. So I want to direct you to, for most of you, it will be the top right hand corner of your screen. You'll see a chat box with a question mark in it. That's how we you can submit questions today. I'll monitor that the whole time. We will likely address all questions at the end. So if you have questions, please feel free to submit them at any time and we will be able to ask them to Bethany. At this time, I will send her screen live. Hello, Bethany, thank you for joining us. Hi, Ann, thanks for having me. And don't worry about not looking up that other stuff. So you guys know we were talking about the important things like Halloween candy right before we went live. So, right, right, you guys get it. <laughs> All right, um, is my screen showing right now? So I you're showing right now okay. and then Bethany has a PowerPoint to share, so whenever we're ready to share that, I will. Why don't you just tell them who you are, what you do, where you work, and then we'll jump in. Yeah, so I am Bethany Epig, and I work at NASA Glenn Research Center physically when I'm not virtually working from home, um, but I'm actually a member of the Radioisotope Power Systems Program Office, which is a headquarters program level. It just happens to be stationed at the Cleveland Center. Um, that office has several different elements to it. The element that I am is the NEPA, which stands for National Environmental Policy Act, and the Launch Approval Manager. Um, so we can really just jump into the slides, and I think that will help you guys understand a bit more about my career. I'm really excited to be here today. All right, you should be good to go. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of my background is that I started my career and 2008 at NASA as a summer intern. So that really did blossom into a full career for me by starting as that summer intern. Um, I started when I was a rising sophomore at Allegheny College up in uh, Pennsylvania, but I'm from Cleveland originally. So when I came back from the summer, it was a really good fit. And honestly, it was, it was just lucky. I applied that summer and I got in and I started as an electrical engineer. I wasn't um, declared yet. So I just kind of took whatever was available. Um, as I stayed there, I was able to look around in some different areas of NASA. So I did several different rotations. I've done algae to fuel research. Um, I went to NASA Ames Research Center for a semester, which is located near San Francisco, California, and I did nanomaterials research there. Um, as I continued on for my master's, I was hired in as a co-op, which is basically a converted position. It's no longer just for a summer. You go to school for a semester and then you work for a semester, go to school for a semester, work for a semester, and then you are not guaranteed a job, but it almost always results in a job at the end of it. Um, I was hired in to the environmental management office when I was starting my master's. It was a master's in environmental policy with a very high chemical focus. Um, and then I completed my master's and I took some extra classes in engineering so that NASA would classify me as an engineer. So that's another topic that I'm happy to help people discuss. Um, even though I don't have an engineering degree, I have a master's and enough engineering classes that they classify me as one. Um, I've spent several years working for the environmental management office and I've done different rotations throughout NASA as well. So I've served as a project manager for the Glenn Extreme Environment Rig um, which is a unique and world-class facility capable of simulating planetary atmospheres and it's known mostly for simulating Venus. I've worked on the harmful algal bloom projects which uses remote sensing technology to monitor the Great Lake algal blooms 
and I was the deputy project manager for the Mars Spring Tire, which was delivering a shape memory alloy tire. So it was actually able to shift. You wouldn't get punctures in it um, to design and deliver the flight qualified tire and wheel assembly for what's going to be known as the Mars sample return mission, which Perseverance is the first of many missions for that. So we're actually looking to retrieve samples from Mars and bring them back in the future. So I now work in the radioisotope power systems program, and this program uses the heat of the radioactive decay of an isotope, and we use that to power deep space missions or anywhere where solar power isn't a viable option. OK, so are they are they switching? Great. Yep. All right, so before I dive too much into the RPS program, I want to just tell you about my jobs, right? So NEPA. Um, that stands for the National Environmental Policy Act, and this brings in my environmental policy background. It was signed into law back in the 1970s, and it requires federal agencies to evaluate our environmental impacts prior to making a decision. So it's a really cool law. So as a part of the NEPA process, the public is also provided an opportunity to review and comment on our evaluations. And this is something that every single NASA mission goes through. So Mars 2020, which launched in July, included and all of our future RPS missions and all missions in general. My focus is specifically the RPS enabled missions completing that NEPA process. I also am known as the launch approval manager. It can flip. Sometimes people call it launch authorization manager. So you might see both those terms used in this uh, presentation. So that makes sure that we conduct all of the safety reviews. Um, before we launch a nuclear enabled payload and this process takes many years to complete right so you figure out what your system is you figure out what type of launch vehicle you're going to put on you figure out how that all could affect where you're going to launch from and then you do a lot of probability assessments on how this the safety levels of this launch so there's varying tiers and review required based on the amount of radioactive material that's present in the launch um, recently, what's known as National Security Presidential Memorandum 20 was signed, which is updating the process for launches of spacecraft containing nuclear systems. And I am one of the working group members that sits on um, a NASA group that's rewriting the NASA policy to align with the federal policies for those launches. So that's, I think, more the, the nitty gritty about what I do every day. I take the lead to manage all the different interfaces between the various organizations that are involved in the NEPA process and launch authorization. So, you know, I'm looking at U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services, Department of Energy, um, the safety offices, the environmental offices, the local centers that we're launching from to organize with their environmental people and their safety offices. All right, so that's the nitty gritty day to day. And now we can get a little bit more into radioisotope power systems in general. So they really do provide us the power to explore and discover and understand our solar systems. So um, we discover new and exciting places. We use them to search for life. Um, and we can use them to better understand and improve our own life back here on Earth with some of the missions that we're doing. So many NASA missions give a high priority by the scientific community to visit some of the harshest, darkest, and coldest locations in our solar system, and those really would not be possible, or they would be extremely limited missions without the use of nuclear power. So a radioisotope power system, or I'll probably call it an RPS, harnesses the heat of the natural decay of what we're using is plutonium-238, and we produce continuous electric power for operating the spacecraft. Oops, sorry. <laughs> trying to scroll down there on my own notes to see what's coming next um, and I went out. So we harness um, the plutonium-238 to produce continuous electric power for operating spacecraft systems and our science instruments. So we can talk with how nuclear power specific the RPS have allowed NASA missions to visit some of those harshest, darkest, and coldest environments located in our solar system. Um, so the we could talk about all of the different things involved, right? So the humans by nature, we're explorers, and RPS is providing the power for exploring these extreme environments. Um, we have provided this power to explore for over 60 years, and as we can see, we've got it kind of put into four themes. So we've got power, people, progress, and production is how the RPS program looks. 
So the RPS program supports the science mission directorate when you look at the people, and that's the NASA's planetary science division, and it's staffed by a really passionate and talented team. We have a lot of cross agency and cross organizational teams. So as I noted, NASA and DOE have a very strong and productive partnership ranging from system development, um, and we distribute leadership from teams across people from Glenn Research Center, NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and we are also good partners with John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory and you know, the Department of Energy. So we're really leveraging the people and the expertise from many different organizations to make these missions happen. So the power side, right? Um, the people allow us to harness that power for these complex missions and change our understanding of our own solar system. The current system that we're using to power the missions is called a multi-mission radio isotope thermoelectric generator. I know that's a mouthful. We call it an MMRTG for short. And the MMRTG is the same one that will power the Perseverance on Mars that launched this past summer. It provides about 110 watts of energy, right? So this is really cool. You're using 110 watts of energy. So I mean, kind of close to like light bulbs here, right? That's less than a microwave to power into tires. Um, it really attends to the innovation of the engineering and science support communities that are supporting the NASA to run on about 100 watts of energy. So, isotope power allows an exploration and the RPS program also can use technology forward. No matter how we explore or how we're exploring, we're still going to need that power and nuclear power is important for deep space exploration. It allows us to explore those extremes of NASA's um, solar system, such as the Voyager missions, which are now actually exploring the outer limits of our sun's sphere of influence and beyond. So these things are really going out there where solar power is not a viable option. It's just too dark to use solar power. Um, the RPS program is continuing to invest in our technologies and development, which are enabling the future science missions. So NASA and DOE are still working together to provide higher efficiency power systems and bridge the science missions and actually human space flight applications as well. And finally, for production, as NASA pushes onward to discover more of the secrets of our universe, as will be made possible by the RPS, which is going to enable things like Dragonfly mission, what's going to Titan, um, and by adding missions back maybe to the Moon and Mars, the RPS program has taken several steps to ensure the availability of that key source that fuels the RPS. So we work with the Department of Energy to establish what's known as continuous rate production for the plutonium. Um, this kept Okay, yeah, sorry, this capability was lost about 30 years ago, and um, some of the first produced plutonium-238 is even in the heat sources that are currently powering Perseverance. So now the Department of Energy is increasing the product production rate of plutonium-238 to support NASA's forecasted needs for all of our missions. So here's just an example of the missions that RPS has powered. So as you can see right here, it has powered 25 missions from the sun to Pluto and beyond. It's really some cool stuff. NASA's New Horizons was the first mission to explore Pluto and the Cooper Belt, I might be pronouncing that wrong, a region just beyond Neptune, which was discovered in the early 1990s um, and has really changed our view of the solar systems, architecture, population structure, formation, and evolution. So this was powered by a single radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or RTG. At the start of the mission, the RTG applied approximately 240 watts to the spacecraft. So once again, this is low power going deep, far into space. Um, it was launched in January of 2016. It passed Jupiter to use a gravity assistant boost, which is a really cool thing where you actually use the gravity of the planet to kind of like swing by. And it sent us some science observations and made the historic flight through Pluto. That took it about, I think it was 2015, and it returned us data, which showed us, you know, a whole new planetary frontier. So now New Horizons is exploring deep out there, um, observing diverse range of objects and measuring the sun's heliosphere. Um, beyond Pluto, it's making rendezvous with other items um, and other planetary bodies, likely seen some of the most primitive objects that have ever been out there. 
and uh, it's just adding really remarkable missions, you know, and history to our science exploration, which is all made possible by RPS. So the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover, which just launched in, in July, that's designed to better understand the geology of Mars and seek signs of ancient life. The mission will collect and store a set of rock and soil samples that will be returned to Earth in a future mission. So that's one that I was working on the tires for. It will also test new technology to benefit future robot exploration of Mars. So as with Curiosity, Perseverance Power System was a multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or MMRTG, which same generates about over currently the required 110 watts for the mission. The RPS program is continuing to invest in our innovative energy conversion technologies that could potential power some science missions into deep craters of the moon and enable spacecraft to survive long, dark, and cold lunar nights. So one of the items we're working on is called a dynamic radioisotope power system, or a DRPS, which could achieve efficiencies on the order of three to four times greater than the current state of the thermoelectric generator, or MMRTG. The DRPS project is targeted to produce three separate prototypes, um, including one system based on a Sterling design, which has already undergone about 14 years of research. So this would be really exciting. We could use less plutonium or use the same amount of plutonium and get three or four times the energy out of it. We're considering doing a demonstration unit on the moon um, to provide to prove the use of the dynamic power in space, making DRPS an excellent candidate to enable specific missions that could not be achieved in any other way. So building on the 60 year heritage of thermoelectric energy conversion, the RPS program is also investing in materials and and design advancements that are showing great promise to bring greater flexibility to future mission designs. As I mentioned previously, in 2027, we plan to launch Dragonfly and it should be arriving to its destination in the mid 2030s. So I'm really excited about Dragonfly. This is the NASA's fourth New Frontiers mission, which are competed missions out of NASA's Planetary Science Division. Dragonfly is going to explore Saturn's moon Titan, which may hold the keys to better understand chemistry here on Earth before life began. So we are partnering with the Applied Physics Laboratory. So under the leadership of the principal investigator, Zibby Turtle, the John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory is developing a drone to fly across Titan. Um, and this is not your average backyard drone. This drone is about the size of a smart car and will have the ability to collect and analyze samples from the Titan surface via on-system laboratories. And RPS, specifically the MMRTG, is currently baseline to provide the heat and power for this system. I'm absolutely thrilled to be managing the NEPA and launch approval process as a part of this mission for the RPS team, and I'm really going to get to see it from start to finish. So that's really cool, right? We're already starting this mission now. We've started working on it. It's 2020, and it's not even going to get there until the mid-2030s. Uh, Dragonfly is going to be flying around Titan every other Titan day, and that's about equivalent to 16 Earth days, and the road will craft will travel from its initial landing site to study areas about 100 miles away from the initial landing site during its planned three-year mission. This is the farthest any scientific rover has traveled. I know it's flying, but during any mission. So really cool stuff. Um, during, and it's going to have about a three-year mission to, to make those 100 miles. The scientific instruments on it include a mass spectrometer um, to identify chemical components, a gamma ray and neutron spectrometer to help analyze surface composition, um, a suite of geophysical and meteorological sensors, um, including a seismometer to detect what they call Titan quakes, and a variety of cameras to image Titan's terrain and help Dragonfly navigate and determine landing sites. So it's going to do what we call a leapfrog effect, where it will fly across, look at all of the potential landing sites, come back to where it was originally but, um, Steve seated, send that information back to Earth, and then we will choose where it will land safely next. So I think as you've you know, seen and heard, it really is an exciting time to be in the RPS program. Um, there's also a new mission that's competing for selection under NASA's 
discovery program, and that's called Trident, like the three-pronged spear carried by the ancient Roman sea god, um, Neptune. The team is one of four that is currently developing concept studies for new missions, and up to two will be selected by the summer of 2021 to become full-fledged missions, and those would be launching sometime this decade. So Trident would explore Triton, which is a unique and highly active icy moon of Neptune, to understand pathways to habitable worlds at tremendous distances from the sun. So Trident is also proposed to be powered by an MMRTG as well at this time. So RPS is well positioned to continue delivering our innovative radioisotope power based systems and technologies that enable groundbreaking and extreme science missions, revolutionizing our understanding of our very own solar system and beyond. So taking a look ahead of us, there really are vast opportunities to continue exploring our solar system and RPS can continue to enable those science missions, thankful to our continued partnership with the Department of Energy, providing us the power to explore. Um, if you are interested in getting involved or learning more, here's just some websites that I wanted to share with you. So rps.nasa.gov has a lot of great information. Um, you can also email our group directly if you have questions and we can get it back to you. So that's nasa-rps.mail.nasa.gov. And I wanted to, you know, put a plug in that I started as a NASA intern and it really blossomed into a full-fledged career for me. And that website is intern.nasa.gov and you use it to apply across all the NASA centers, but you can like deselect, you know, and filter things out. So if anybody wants more information on that, please let me know. They offer internships from high school through PhD. So even the high school ones are tough, but you guys can get to them. Um, and there's a lot more opportunities once you're in your undergrad. You do have to be a US citizen and at least 16 year old, 16 years old to apply though. So I want to make sure you guys know that. But if anybody wants has questions, like please feel free to reach out to me. I wanted to thank you for your time today and inviting me here to talk. I love talking about RPS and I just think it's really cool stuff that I like sharing with the world and I look forward to any questions that you guys might have. Thanks, Bethany. So I'm now going to send just your screen, just your face live. Um, and for everyone out there who is listening, I have put all of the, the two websites and the email address that Bethany mentioned in the Q&A as an announcement. So you'll be able to access that at any point before we leave. So if you're interested, I would definitely take a, a second here to copy and paste that so that you have it before we hang up. Um, and just a reminder, because we do have some questions coming in, but just a reminder, where that is, uh, it's going to be a little thought bubble with a question mark uh, on it, and you can submit questions at any point at this point. So let me start with the first one, Bethany. What would you recommend a high school student to do if they want to work at NASA someday? And so maybe that's, let's say, like in the classroom, but outside of the classroom as well. Okay, so one of the things that you have to do if you want to be an intern is that you do have to maintain a 3.0 GPA. So first off, you need to make sure your grades are up to, to date um, and you're meeting that eligibility requirement. The other thing is apply early. There are a ton of opportunities on that intern.nasa.gov and you're also going to need recommendations from if it's I mean, I don't know if the process is the same from when I applied 10 years ago, but I'm assuming it's similar recommendations from your teachers or adults that you've worked with and give them time to write that. Don't surprise them the day before it's due that you need a recommendation letter. And then you can get it all into the system, but also check back frequently because new opportunities are constantly being posted and really don't give up. So I applied to NASA as a high school intern and I got to the interview process and I didn't get it. The high school internships are extremely competitive, right? And think about what would have happened if I just said, well, I'm, I'm done with this now because I didn't get it my first shot. So I applied again in college and the advice for that is I applied to things that I was really interested in. I was really interested in chemical engineering um, at that time in biology. Well, I still applied to a lot of things just because I knew I wanted to give NASA a try. I got pulled for an electrical engineering internship, which I knew nothing about, but I was undeclared. So I took it, right? And I think a lot of people are afraid to take opportunities that are really outside of their comfort zone. 
But I mean, it's an internship. They know that you're going to have things to learn. So this is a great chance to get outside of your comfort zone and try out new areas and see how it works. And I did decide that electrical engineering wasn't exactly for me. But while I was there, I still did the work. I learned a ton and I made a lot of connections that then opened up future internship opportunities for me. Um, so remember, it's not about who you know, it's about who knows you. So mm -hmm. when you do get those opportunities, make good impressions, work hard, and let people know that you're interested in, in future opportunities. And a lot of people are really willing to mentor and help. I think that's such a great story, and I like that you admitted that you were rejected round one and that you know failure wasn't the be all end all for you and that rejection wasn't the end and it's an important message to give that you know just because you might get a rejection or a no at some point that doesn't mean that's the end of your journey that wasn't the end of NASA for you so thank you for sharing that I think a really good and important message um, so another question and we get this one often too is um what's your favorite thing about your job and then what's your least favorite thing about your job all right, so my favorite thing about my job is that NASA really lets you try out so many cool opportunities, right? So I am const I feel like I'm still in college. I am constantly learning. I am in a career field that we are discovering things, we are researching, we are trying to design new systems. So we're still learning and NASA really encourages learning. So they encourage us to learn about what's happening in the different organizations, keep up with the current studies. So I love that I'm in an organization that is constantly teaching me new things. Um, there, when I was on projects that were, I think in the last two years alone, I've worked on projects that are going to the moon, Mars, Venus, and then some here on Earth and now Titan, right? So that's a lot of information to take in um, and, and learn about a ton of different types of environments and atmospheres and even the, the days are different. Um, so, you know, a lunar day is different from a Titan day, which is different from an Earth day. So they're all different time spans. It's a really cool, cool group to just be in and on this cutting edge research. Oh, least favorite. That's that's a tough one. Um, I would say that as I have continued my career at NASA, I really liked being an intern because I got to be in the lab, hands on, um, really working things. Now, as I have continued to develop in my career, I've taken much more of a leadership position and I'm still involved in really cool stuff, right? But it's more from a, a management and leadership perspective and a learning and creating perspective and progressive area instead of I don't get to, you know, hands on touch the hardware anymore. I'm not touching any plutonium guys. <laughs> so I did get to go to Department of Energy, one of their labs and see, you know, a process of how they make it, but I do miss the hands on stuff. Right, right. Um, so another question, what different types of engineering can be used slash done at NASA? Oh, I you name it, we've got it. Um, <laughs> so I started out as an environmental engineer and I worked in the environmental office when I was officially hired in as an environmental engineer um, and I worked very closely with civil engineers and we dealt with things, you know, like stormwater runoff and buildings and the NEPA process for all of NASA. Um, we have safety engineers, right? We have mechanical engineers. We have thermal engineers. Um, gosh, I'm I don't even know. I'm just I think coded as like a, a program engineer, which is like a very general one. Right right now um chemical engineers i i you name the engineering type it is here yeah fair yeah. fair and a great answer for whoever asked that question if they were thinking of specific engineering for college to know that it could be any of them right. yeah yeah i mean we hire just you know you know same facility types engineers so we hire engineers to build buildings we hire engineers based with science you know stuff so very well diverse. Yeah, definitely. Um, you you've alluded to some of these, but can you actually speak to some of the sort of like soft skills, essential skills that someone in your role would need? Um, obviously, every day is different, so maybe a little bit of flexibility in there. But what are some of the skills that you know outside of 
academics that students would need? All right, so one that I actually focus a lot on is that we work with a ton of different organizations, right? So I am in meetings, especially at this level, with the Department of Energy, um, the Department of Defense, the US Air Force, because we're all trying to do similar testing on some propellants for future spacecraft. So we're all just, hey, how can we share information? So you definitely need to listen to your stakeholders. Um, if you want to do good partnerships, and this goes from you know your team members all the way up to your higher ups, managing expectations, making sure that everybody understands what's expected of them, what the timelines are, um, what are the action, we call them action items that are coming out of meetings, uh, making sure people are prepped before meetings so that you're not just wasting time. So we call that all stakeholder expectations and stakeholder management and engagement. So that's really important. Another thing that I highly recommend to people is to do maybe like a Myers-Briggs, um, so emotional intelligent type of things. I am an extroverted engineer, which is a, a rare, like a unicorn. Um, so I work with a lot of very introverted engineers engineers and I talk out loud. I think out loud. They need time to process and then get back to me what they have. So if I surprise them with a question in the middle of a meeting, that's really unfair for their personality type. Uh, that's why I need to prepare them to come to the meeting or give them time to think about things. Um, so what I have done is I've done a lot of emotional intelligent tests with my team members so that we can all better understand how everybody interacts together. And it's good to just know how you interact to and maybe how others who aren't the same as you view those actions. So to them, I could be considered very aggressive because I talk out loud and I think out loud um, and they they it helps them learn that. I'm not trying to put them on the spot. That's just how I think and it helps me to get frustrated when they tell me they you know not get frustrated if they don't know an answer to something. I know not to ask them something on the spot, right? I I know to prepare to give them time to get the answers back to me. So definitely understanding yourself and your team members. Yeah, that's it. That's a great one. And I'm not sure we've heard that yet throughout kind of our series. So I really appreciate that you brought that up. We hear teamwork a lot, but you really specified why and how that can be so important and so useful. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I want to be mindful of your time um, and everybody's time on the call. So I'm actually just going to leave you with a question that we end kind of all of our sessions with. So for our seniors, upperclassmen who are out there and they're deciding what comes next and navigating all of these decisions, what advice would you give to them as they're figuring it all out? Hmm. All right, so be flexible, right? So have your plan. But if the plan doesn't go as you think it's going to lay out, you know, that doesn't mean that it's. So definitely make some long term goals for yourself. Like when I was a college intern, I said I want to work for NASA, right? So I'm going to lay out the steps that I think are appropriate for me to get there. So that's applying to a lot of internships. That's taking certain classes. Um, but it didn't always work out out like I planned it, right? So I took much longer to get in officially to NASA than I thought it would. I, I ended up having to go undergrad so that I could stay eligible for internships because I had not yet been hired in at NASA, right? So it was good. For it all balanced out, but I was originally not planning on going to grad school, right? But then I talked with mentors and they said, well, there's no positions open right now. Go to grad school. In the long run, then you can keep interning, you know, so you have our resume while we position to open up. So you get get your goal and you probably want to keep that goal. But if for some reason you're chasing a goal that you you realize doesn't work out, stop chasing that, like rearrange. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to, to stay that goal, but also while you're chasing it, be flexible with how you get there things aren't always going to work out the way you planned. And that's OK, because every opportunity that you have is going to make you a well rounded person. You know, it's always going to benefit you in the long run, whether it's helping you learn that, you know, you didn't like that job or you did like that job 
or maybe you're switching career fields. And if it's something that you're not interested in, that's OK, too. So if you tried out an internship that you thought was your, your dream and you hated it, that, that's good to know as well, right? Like, don't be crushed. Um, it's all benefiting you. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, Bethany, and thank you for spending the last 35 minutes with us. I really appreciate it. So um, do you have any last words to share before we sign off? I'm just, yeah, really happy to be here. Please feel free to use the email if you want to get some questions to me. Um, or if you have a really specific question about RPS, I can make sure that gets to somebody in the group that can answer it, maybe one of our systems formulation people, and really reach out, uh, take opportunities, you know, when they're presented to you, and try to reach out to mentors in your areas too, for whatever your career field is interested in. Um, talk to people about it, get connected, and, and try out new opportunities. You never know where it's gonna lead. You're in charge of your own career and, and never forget that. Well, thank you so much, Bethany. We really appreciate that and all of your words of advice and all of the information you had to share. Um, for everyone out there, if you have questions for Bethany or, or any, any questions about NASA, please feel free to send them along to myself or Nick Pellini. Both of our emails have been available throughout all of our communication and also on our website. So please let me know. We're happy to make connections. And thank you, Bethany, for offering to answer questions as well. And I'll just leave you with the same thing I always do. Please keep an eye on our website for all of the links for everything that we're doing here. Plenty of sessions between now and December, and we're happy to have you for all of them. So thank you, everyone, for joining and enjoy the rest of your day.